as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. You might wonder, well, what are they to put on? I think his point is elaborate dresses. The point is don't be so concerned about the outer appearance. As he explains in the next verse, it's the inner person that's important. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman. And show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. A few years ago, a book came out titled, Wifedom. It is a biography on Eileen O'Shaughnessy, who became the wife of author Eric Blair. She was brilliant. She was an honor student at Oxford where her tutors included J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. She was pursuing a master's degree when she gave it all up to marry Eric. She devoted her life to helping his career and succeeded. Without her sacrifice, we might not know the name of her husband, whose pen name is George Orwell, author of Animal Farm in 1984. She's an example, especially since it wasn't a Christian marriage. So how much more should a Christian wife be willing to sacrifice for the success of her family and the spiritual good of her husband? And how much more should a husband be willing to do that for his wife? That's the subject of our passage. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, the relationship of wives and husbands, and especially of wives and wifedom. Now, if wifedom seems like an old-fashioned word, then the subject will seem particularly old-fashioned to some as well. But it is Peter's instruction. And it fits the subject that he began back in chapter 2, verse 13, where he stated that we are to submit to every human institution. In verse 18... He brought that instruction into the home with instruction to servants, household servants, to be submissive to masters. And now in chapter 3, Peter goes deeper into the home with instruction for husbands and wives who are the two fundamental parts or participants of a Christian home and marriage. Uh, The fluctuating moral standards of modern society can't change biblical marriage, which is only between a man and a woman, and I would add to that, only one man with one woman. Peter began with wives in verse 1, and he gave more space to them than to husbands, as you will have noticed, in order to be clear about this message of submission, which applies more to the wives. His instruction to husbands is made clear in, verse one, in, in one verse, verse 7, and is no less demanding because of its brevity. In fact, 
As I reflect on it, I think it is actually more demanding than what he has to say for wives. Well, Peter began, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands. In the same way connects this passage, this instruction, with that which was given previously to servants in chapter 2, verse 18, though not in the, the, the same way that makes women comparable to slaves or household domestics. For example, in James chapter 2, verse 25, this same word, which is usually translated or usually means likewise or similarly, is used of Rahab in comparison to Abraham. There's a great difference between the two of them. But her faith was demonstrated in the same way his was by works. Abraham and, and uh, Rahab are very different people, but they are similar in the fact that their faith was justified or proven to be real by their works. And so in that sense, they are alike. Wives and slaves are very different from each other and were to be considered differently. Peter makes that plain in his instruction to the husbands. But they were similar or to be similar or uh, the same in their response to authority. Just as slaves were to be submissive in a hard circumstance, very difficult circumstance, for the Lord's sake, so too were wives. And Peter made it clear that <clears throat> the wife is under the authority of her husband and is to willingly submit to him even when he is an unbeliever, which makes this a very difficult situation. Now again, that's what Peter states, be submissive, so that even if any one of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. The subject of submission, I don't really need to say this, but Nevertheless, the subject of submission is a sensitive subject today, but it shouldn't be understood to compromise the personhood of the woman or imply that she is spiritually inferior to the man, inferior in any sense. This is not about the essential dignity of a woman and a man. It is about the function or the role and responsibility of each person within the marriage relationship. And that's made clear from the relationships within the Godhead, the, the Trinity, as explained by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. We see the relationship there, and it helps us understand the relationships here. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman. I would take that as why, a wife. And God is the head of Christ. Within the Trinity, the Father and Son are co-eternal and co-equal. They are of the same essence. I and the Father are one, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30. But in terms of their function in carrying out the plan of salvation, Christ was voluntarily submissive to the Father. In John chapter 5, verse 19, he said, The Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, these things the Son does in like manner. But the Father and Son are equal in person. So too are husbands and wives. Peter indicates that their, uh, their personal and spiritual equality in verse 7, again as I mentioned, men and women are, he said, fellow heirs. The, the husband has not more of an heir 
than of the glory to come and the kingdom to come than the wife. They are fellow heirs. They are equals. But the wife's role under the husband's authority in the home is to be understood here. Obeying commands sounds a little draconian. This isn't docile servility, but more like cooperating with the husband and following his lead. I think in a healthy home, there is mutual counsel and sometimes wise compromise. The Bible has uh, uh, sufficient examples of that very thing, of husbands who, who listened to their wives or re- resisted listening to their wives. And when they resisted, they did so to their own detriment. One of the great examples of that is Pilate. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, he received a message from his wife. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. He didn't listen to his great loss. Even Abraham. Uh, we, we come to the example of Sarah as being the example of how a woman is to live in relation to her husband. But you'll remember in, uh, in Genesis 21, they have Isaac as their, their son. This is the heir. Well, they already had another son, Ishmael. And Sarah observes Ishmael taunting this son, his half-brother. And she saw something very dangerous in that, and she told Abraham to cast out, drive out the bondwoman and her son. Abraham resisted that. I'm not going to do that. That's my son. Then God spoke to him. He said, listen to your wife. He did. To the blessing of Isaac and all of Israel. Well, then there's Samson's mother. She showed greater understanding and insight than Manoah, Samson's father, in Judges chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. They have a theophany. There's a, 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 the angel of the Lord appears to them, and suddenly he vanishes in a flame on the altar, and Manoah is terrified. We've just seen God, and we're going to die. And she says, well, if we were going to die, we'd be dead. And it calms him down. So, women have good counsel. The role of men and women is not based on intelligence. Some women are brighter and more insightful than their husbands. I know that. For example, in my home, I have a helper. (laughs) My wife, who has a number of advantages over me, she's better at math than I am. But so are all of you. (laughs) She speaks more languages than I do. I speak one. At least I try. And she can spell the words better than me. I don't understand it. But she has perfect spelling. I I need her. She helps me out a great deal. The point here is the, the, a blessing, the wife is to be a blessing and a helpmate in marriage, and they're, they are necessary, and really, they are helpful. Still, without exception, God's order for marriage is male headship, which, uh, with the wife at the man's side as the husband's partner. She is, has a vital role to play. Uh, so a wise husband listens to his wife's advice. Nowhere in the Bible, however, are the roles reversed, even when the husband is an unbeliever. And in that case, it's very important for Christian women to play well the biblical role of the wife so that, Peter says, their husbands may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Now, he didn't mean by that that an unbeliever can be converted without the, the preaching or the giving of the gospel. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. 
these men who have uh, are, are men who have heard the gospel already and rejected it. They are called disobedient to the word. And while the details here are not given, I suspect that the circumstance is this, that these were two Gentiles, the, a man and a woman, a man and a wife, and they hear the gospel, and they're saved out of pay, or the wife is saved out of paganism, but the, the husband did not believe. And so here's the situation. She is in a marriage in which she's unequally yoked. It's the providence of God, how she to behave. And so that's what Peter is dealing with here. Very difficult situation. And so how is she to be, be, behave? Well, he's heard the gospel. And there comes a point when, when nothing more can be said. And, and when nothing more, I, I would add, should be said. Then the best witness is not to keep after him with, with the gospel, but it is, is behavior. Uh, uh, not just within marriage, but outside of the marriage as well. And in that way, Peter said, they may be one for Christ. We can't always speak to non-believers, but we can always live before them and live well. That is a witness, and that is a means of grace. Now, Peter develops that in verse 2. This will happen within the home, he wrote, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. The word chaste, chaste behavior means something like um, free of moral defilement. It's behavior that is guiltless. And so it is, again, a reminder of the, the principle that governs submission. It's not unqualified. It is qualified. It should never, submission should never come to the point of violating God's commands. So if she is urged to do something that is not legal, not right, not proper, she cannot do that. She must have chaste behavior. But obedience within the role that God has intended for the wife displays a moral and spiritual beauty that may be uh, and will be attractive to an unbelieving husband. I'll give you an example of that. Augustine gave it in his Confessions of how his mother did that very thing. She was a, a, a Christian and his father was not. He was a pagan. But she lived a godly life before him for years and honored him. The confess, confessions, I, I think you probably know this, were written as a prayer to God. Each chapter is a prayer to God. And so all through it, Augustine is speaking to the Lord uh, about everything that he says. And he wrote, she served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you, speaking to him of you by her conduct by which you made her beautiful. He spoke at length of the uh, abuses that his mother suffered under that relationship. Her, her father was, uh, his father was unfaithful. Uh, he had a very bad temper. But she remained faithful to him as a wife and a witness. Finally, Augustine wrote, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. She was a persevering saint. She had a long obedience. But as Augustine said, through her conduct, you made her beautiful. God will do that for a faithful, sacrificial wife who honors her husband. She, she may not win the unbelieving spouse. It may not turn out as it did for Monica, Augustine's mother, but it will please God. He was pleased with Abigail. She was married to an unbeliever, Nabal. He was a fool, 
a rich, arrogant fool who by his selfish ingratitude invited the wrath of David who set out to kill him. Abigail wisely intervened to save Nabal's life. She saved him from David. She saved David from himself. But she could not save Nabal from God who struck him dead after a night of heavy drinking and celebration. Abigail's behavior made her beautiful in David's eyes, and when she became a widow, he married her. When a wife honors her husband, there is, there is beauty about her. God honors her and rewards her. In verse 3, Paul, uh, Peter elaborates on the, the, the kind of beauty that is godly. It is inward, not outward. Doesn't consist of visible things, but a spiritual condition that shines through the outer person. Your adornment must not be merely external. That, that word merely, you'll notice, is in italics. It's been added, but I think properly uh, added. He's not giving this absolute rule, you can't do these things. Your adornment, he's not saying no adornment at all, in other words. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses. I think we can understand this in light of the culture of that day. And you see this in some of the, the statues, uh, busts of, uh, of, of people. The, the women would have very elaborately coiffured hair. These were more of the patrician women of the Roman society. And they, they decorate themselves. Uh, spend a lot of time on that, ev evidently. Um, and so what Peter is saying here is cultivate not the outer person, but the inner person. That's where the adornment is to, to be done. Now, this word adornment is the word, the Greek word cosmos. We're all familiar with that. It, it means wor uh, world or universe. But it also basically means ornament or adornment. So we get the word cosmetic from it. And Peter's meaning is Christian women should not depend on outward things for their adornment. He, he, he didn't mean, I don't think, don't be stylish. Just that external things are not the source of beauty. Uh, I say uh, um, this is not an absolute prohibition on jewelry of any kind. Because you remember Abraham's servant placed two gold bracelets on Rebekah when he saw that she was to be the future bride of Isaac. Well, that's jewelry, and he placed it on her, and it was proper to do that. But that didn't make her beautiful. She was already beautiful. The real person and the person who should be cultivated and manifested is what Peter describes in verse 4, the hidden person of the heart. The inner person is revealed in a wife's words and actions. That, that applies to men as well. But here the subject is women. And the things that shine through are imperishable, Peter says. Things like a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. God told Samuel, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The things of the heart last forever and have eternal reward while the external fades, turns to dust. The adjective gentle in gentle spirit is rare. Wayne Grudem in his commentary defines it as not insistent on one's own rights, or not pushy, not selfishly assertive, not de demanding one's own rights. And that, that goes completely against the natural man today who demands his rights. Now, I, I qualify this because as citizens, we do have rights. 
under the law, and we're not wrong to insist on our rights. But in personal relationships, children of God are different, and they are to behave differently from the world. I like my old Hebrew, Hebrew professor's definition of righteousness. Willingly disadvantaging self for the advantage of others. In other words, putting others ahead of ourselves. That involves personal sacrifice. All of this does. For both the male, the, 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 the wife and the husband. But it is an effective witness to people and unbelieving husbands. But more importantly, more importantly, it is beautiful to God. And it has lasting reward. The person who concentrates on these qualities will be tastefully modest. And I doubt that I can define that to everybody's satisfaction, and really it will differ from person to person. But, but Peter's emphasis, emphasis is on the inner qualities. Paul's statement in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, I think applies. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those are all inner qualities. That's what's important. Christianity can't be reduced to things. And the apostles didn't set up a strict dress code. But they did lay down principles, and we need to be sensitive to them. All is to be done to God's glory. That applies to the wife, that applies to the husband. Everything is to be done to his glory. Paul said that in a very interesting statement. I find it interesting in, second, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In the most mundane things in life, we are to, to do them to the glory of God. Well, certainly then, if the simplest things in life are to be done with God's glory in mind, then the great things are as well. All of our life is to be lived to His glory, and He'll make everything right. Now, to support his exhortation to be submissive, Peter appeals to previous examples, the, the holy women, the saintly women of the Old Testament, who, he writes, hoped in God. They adorned themselves in the same way that Peter has recommended, by being submissive to their own husbands. It, it wasn't any easier to do that then than it is now. But they were able to do it because they trusted in the Lord. They hoped in God, Peter said. That's the key to all right behavior. It's not said of the husband, but you can import that to verse 7 as well. This is for all of us. We have hope before us, and that is the great motivation for the obedience that we, that we observe. It's the key to right behavior. In verse 6, Peter gave a specific example of that with Sarah. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And Peter didn't record the occasion when Sarah did this, called him Lord. Some think he was referring to Genesis 18, verse 12, when God announced the birth of Isaac. And you'll remember, Sarah's response was, she's behind the tent, she's, or she's in the tent listening and can't be seen, and she laughed. She laughed in unbelief. She said, after I have become old, and shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? She was 90 years old at the time, and Abraham was 100. It, it seemed impossible to her. And humanly speaking, it was impossible. So may, perhaps that's when she called him Lord. But the problem with that is it's not exa an example of hoping in God. In fact, just the opposite. 
Probably it's better to understand Peter's statement here as referring to her general attitude. The, the verb calling is actually a present participle suggesting continual action, characteristic behavior. Sarah is a good example of trust and godly behavior for a couple of reasons. She is the mother of the old covenant people of God, Israel. So she was greatly honored of God. And she had a, a hard life. One in which she, was, she had to trust God in some very difficult circumstances and some uh, unpleasant, dangerous situations. When Abraham was called out of Ur, she followed. That was honoring her husband and obeying God with the result that, that she had to leave her home, leave her family, and go with Abraham to a land they've never, never seen before. And that was honoring him and living by faith. Twice, you remember, Abraham called her his sister. She was his half-sister. So he wasn't completely deceptive. But as a result of that, she was taken into a man's harem. In fact, twice. Now, that was an unintended consequence on Abraham's part. Uh, but it happened, and, it, and as I said, it happened twice, and twice God rescued her. God saved her. She let Abraham take Isaac to be sacrificed. We don't have any record of him saying, I'm going to be doing this with our son. But we can assume that she knew what was taking place, and she was submissive to that. Uh, she did not have an easy life. But she honored her husband and, and trusted God, and he blessed her greatly. That must have been a great encouragement to the wives to whom Peter was writing here. He said they were like her if they trusted God and they were obedient. You have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by fear. Without being frightened by any fear is a way of, of referring to trust in God. And you can imagine that these unbelieving, these wives with unbelieving husbands probably had a lot of fears, a lot of, uh, of uncertainty about their life. But Peter calms them with the assurance that God takes care of his people. He took care of Sarah all through her life. Now in verse 7, Peter turns to husbands. In this section on submission, this is the only case of instruction being given to those who have authority over the group that's just been addressed. Now Peter didn't tell them to be submissive. His command is to be respectful of their wives, to be considerate of them, to be very sensitive to them. So now he's addressing Christian husbands, not the unbelieving husband. He first tells husbands to live with their wives in an understanding way. Literally, it is living together according to knowledge. Peter doesn't state what knowledge he's referring to here, but the idea probably includes whatever knowledge would help the relationship. Uh, that, that would be knowledge of God's purpose for marriage, the principles of marriage, but also personal knowledge of the wife, of, of her desires, her goals, her frustrations, of her strengths and weaknesses. Part of the knowledge, or living in an understanding way with the wife, is knowing that she is weaker. Literally, a weaker vessel. That's not a disparaging, demeaning term. All humans, men and women, are earthen vessels. Clay pots made from the, the dust of the earth. Weak and dependent creatures. That's what Paul calls us in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But women 
are the weaker of the two. Uh, Peter didn't explain that. I suppose he didn't explain it because he felt it was self-evident. Women are generally weaker physically than men. Uh, a husband can overpower his wife and be a threat to her. And Peter is warning against that in this. Women, I think, tend to be more sensitive, which is a strength as a mother. Uh, she's often more compassionate and affectionate toward children. But she may also be more vulnerable to verbal abuse. There are exceptions to this, of course. In 1973, Billie Jean King beat Bobby Riggs in a tennis match called the Battle of the Sexes. I watched it on television with 50 million other people. Probably 20 years ago, I picked up a book about women and their brave deeds. It was titled, Living with Cannibals and Other Women's Adventures. <laughs> You'd pick it up too if you read that title. The adventures included climbing mountains, scaling cliffs, treks across deserts, journeys into jungles, living with cannibals, persevering through falls, broken bones, and all kinds of dangers. It shows that some women are stronger, bolder, emotionally tougher than a lot of men. But again, as a rule, women are weaker than men. And so more vulnerable to abuse. I think women's sports today is going through a crisis that demonstrates that very thing. When men are trying to, and are, in, in, involving themselves in it. Well, more vulnerable to abuse is Peter's concern here. He's not boasting of male prowess. He, he's warning husbands against abusing their authority and taking advantage of their wives for some personal gain or, or some act of pride. His instruction to husbands is, show her honor. That's what God does. He honors those who are weak. He honors those who are less honored in the eyes of men. That's us. Paul talks about that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Who did he choose? Not many noble are called, he said. God honors the weak. And the husband is to honor his wife. Imitate Christ. And what does that mean? Sacrifice your life for her. Well, that takes us back to Paul's instruction in Ephesians chapter 5. Peter didn't say how that was to be done, but, but positively, I would suggest by being uh, encouraging verbally to the wife and allowing her to use her God-given gifts and have independence in those areas. Great example of that, the great text, in my mind, is Proverbs 31. The virtuous woman. She's independent. She, she's a businesswoman. She's in charge of the home. And he's able to do things other than that. Be at the gate and acting as a judge. The wife is not an appendage. She's a partner. She's a vital part of the relationship. When God made Adam, he said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Eve complemented and completed Adam. She's the other half of the relationship. The other equal half of the relationship. And wives complete husbands. A husband, deny, who, a, a husband denies his wife the place, the responsibilities, and the honor she is due to his own detriment. That, that, I think, is sort of a utilitarian explanation of, of Peter's instruction here. And so maybe not the best. His instruction is based on Genesis chapter 2. His description of her as a fellow heir of the grace of life suggests that. God formed the woman out of the man. 
She's made of the same stuff as he is. She is of the same essence as he is. So an equal in person. And she, is, she has divine responsibilities. He is to honor that. And someday, every husband will give an account to the Lord for how he discharged his duty toward his wife. Now, Peter, did, Peter didn't say that in this text, but it's certainly implied in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, about be, uh, appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll all do that, and we'll all give an account. What Peter does say is that in the meantime, presently, a, a, a husband's spiritual life is affected by not obeying the Lord in his husbandly duties. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Failure to understand the wife's role and honor her will frustrate a man's spiritual life and his spiritual service. It will hinder his prayers. That's divine discipline for disobedience. Your prayers won't be answered. You go through difficulties in life. You have problems at work. You have problems in the home, you have problems economically, you have health problems, you go to the Lord, your prayers are going to be hindered, not answered. It's as though, I don't want to speak too harshly, you, you put yourself, you're put out on an island by yourself, and the Lord says in effect, you want to do it your way, then you figure it out. Now, he doesn't talk that way, and he doesn't think that way. That's to make a point, I guess, but the point is, if a husband does not follow this instruction, it will affect his spiritual life. That's why I say, really, while there's just one verse for the husband, nevertheless, this is the more demanding of all that's been said. Well, I'm sure that can be applied to wives as well, who refuse to honor their husbands. Again, th th this takes self-sacrifice for both. Putting the other person first. That's, that's just the Christian life. That's the life of righteousness. So it's necessary for both to carry out their roles in marriage. It is a witness to the world, and most importantly, it pleases the Lord God. But before we can do anything that is pleasing to God Almighty who holds our destiny in his hand, we must believe in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from faith in him, a person, man or woman, is lost and doomed to an eternity of darkness and aloneness. The judgment of God described as fire. Revelation 20, verse 14. How horrible. Escape that. Come to Christ, believe in Him as your God and Savior. All who do are forgiven at that very moment and receive new life, clean life, eternal life. May God help you to do that.